Good morning. We got to let people know we're alive in here, man. Um, how many of you have not heard me before? Not heard me? Okay, I apologize right to begin with. You just don't know what you're in for. Um, once I get going, I get going. I will try and slow it down, but it is very hard for me to slow down. And so uh, let me do one thing real quick here just to make sure I got audio. I'm going to check this real quick. Don't get old. I can't see anything anymore. Got to wear glasses to see and hearing aids to hear. It's no fun. Uh, but I want to make sure that I got the audio in the right spot. Headphones. Yep, we're good. So this morning, thanks for letting me come back, by the way. That's not normal. <laughs> yeah, it's typically like one and done. So, uh, yeah, but uh, thank you all for letting me come back. I do appreciate it, young folks. Thanks for the bribe. I have to admit, that is the best bribe I have ever heard of. A million bucks. Um, please pray for my family just before I start off. This is my family. Just to kind of give you a little bit uh, of uh, our family there. Far right, that's my son. And uh, he's 32. Has two children. Uh, that's his wife. She's from South Africa. Uh, we have a very international house, trust me. Holidays around our place are awesome. Yeah, you come over for a holiday meal, you don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> it's food from everywhere. Uh, that's my first granddaughter and uh, from them, my first grandson from them. And that's my wife, she's from Japan. And uh, that's our second grandson and granddaughter from my daughter and her husband, who's from Michigan. I don't know how he snuck in there, but had to get a blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy in there as well so that we cover all the bases. Uh, but pray for my wife. She's the one that really makes everything happen. We've been married 34 years, and she is a blessing. I just, yesterday, it really hit me how hard how, how much of a blessing she really is to allow me to do what I do, what I love to do passionate about. Um, can I show you all a, a little promo for a new video that I got coming out next month? That was really weak. Can I show you all a promo for a new video? Okay. Um, pray for us on this too. I'm just, I'm throwing out some prayer requests here because uh, this is something, mature folks, forgive me, I'm going after this generation right here. And this generation thinks different than your generation. This generation has a 2.2 second attention span. And that is not a joke. That is exactly what the studies show. 2.2 second attention span. The latest report that I read said the, the younger generation has an attention span shorter than a goldfish. <laughs> I'm just telling you what they said, man. That's not a joke. That is the truth of the research. So I'm going after that generation. I will not compromise the word of God. I will not compromise uh, theology or anything like that. But the way that I will deliver the message, you better believe I'll do it in a different way. Because if I want to reach this generation, it's not going to work the way that we've done things in the past. And so this is, I want to talk about fossils. Let me take you out into the fossil field. Glendive, Montana, by the way, a little plug here. I've got a card back on my table. Everything on my table is donation, everything, except for the pre-order in this. We put a lot of money into it, so I have to charge for this. But um, come with me next year, July 18 to 25. We're going to go dig dinosaur bones. We'll be in the field. I want you to see for yourself. If you think the dinosaur bones support slow gradual processes over millions of years, come dig dinosaur bones. Because this is where I filmed this last year. So just a little promo that we've put together. We're finishing this right now. Should be out early May. Audio. Think about the amazing beauty and complexity that we see in the world around us. How is it that so many people can understand these things so differently when we're all looking at the same evidence? I've always thought that when we're asked a question, we should question the question. What are we doing now? Well, we're going to see about checking out some dinosaur bones. I'd like to have you do some digging on this. No way. A screwdriver? Where's my, where's my big old hammer? Oh, no, no. We are constantly being bombarded by the perspective of the world. You might be wondering, what is a worldview? Who or what is impacting your worldview? It's starting to petrify. This is all stone right here. So this is still real, live, it would burn type wood. Wow. I can hear some of you laughing, but think about this. If there is no God, then that is the only alternative. 
This is amazing, man. I can't wait to get inside. This exhibit with the T-Rex, we do have two mammals in it also. We did that because mammals have been found with dinosaurs. Right. They've been all found at the same time, at the same place, and that's consistent with what it says in the Bible. Where did we come from? Why would a loving God allow death and suffering? What about carbon dating? If God created everything, who created your God? I don't know about you, but I need a point of reference to wade through all of this modern day information and one that I can trust and not just intellectually. I need one that explains the evidence that I see in the world around me. So, you've got a choice to make. What we see in the world around us, is it more consistent with design or with random chance processes? The decision is yours. called Weapons of Mass Instruction Fossils. It's the first in a series. And so uh, pray for us. Pray for us. This is, a, this is a big outreach. We've never done anything like this, but we decided to go for it. This morning, though, I get to talk to you about remote control, the power of Hollywood on today's world. Uh, the name of the ministry is Reasons for Hope. Thank you for letting us come back. Uh, I think that this talk here is a very important one. Uh, I, I, I hear many, many times how, oh, media is not an important thing, TV is not an important thing, video games aren't an important thing, and they are. They truly are having an impact. How many of you in here have ever seen any of the Rocky movies? Any of the Rocky movies? Unbelievable. Even Canada, it's infiltrated up here. Okay, for those of you that have not seen the, some of the Rocky movies, I figured, let's, let me educate you a little bit. I'm going to show you Six Rockies in five seconds. Are you ready for this? Okay, this is not going to work. You guys are like seriously frozen on me. This is not Sunday morning. Sunday morning you can go into frozen chosen mode, but today you're going to have to warm up just a little bit, okay? The winter's gone, we're thawing out. So you're ready for this? All right, hang on. Six Rockies. And five seconds. <laughs> leave, my, leave the audio up. Just leave it up all the time. A pig in the foot. Rush for Deutsch. Proclamation. Manual 60. So you have now been brought up to speed on Rocky. Okay. So here we go. When, we, when I deal with media, there's a few things that I want to do. As a matter of fact, when I deal with anything in the culture, this is what I want to do. I want to teach a generation how to use the world as their classroom. For too long, we in the church adopted the world's way of educating, which was memorization, then regurgitation. I mean, when I went to school, that's what I was taught. Go memorize this stuff, come back tomorrow, I'm going to test you, and you will regurgitate back to me what I gave to you, and I will grade you on how well you regurgitate. Well, regurgitation isn't pretty, it doesn't look good, and it doesn't smell good, okay? And it is not the way that we should educate a generation. We need to educate a generation how to apply their faith in the real world. Because Satan doesn't play fair, and he's coming after this generation, no holds barred. So when it comes to our faith, we need to know it, live it, share it. When it comes to our faith, uh, we need to be able to, first of all, like I say, know it. What do I mean by that? Well, you need to know why you believe what you say you believe, because the world is coming after this generation. Average time a young person spends in a school system is 900 hours a year. That's the average time a young person spends in a school system. Now, I can't talk about Canada, all right? I don't know that much. This is... Second time in, you know, two years that I get up here, so I don't know your culture that well. I can only talk about what I know about in my country, and maybe you'll see some parallels. But in my country, 900 hours a year is the average time a young person spends in a school system. Well, that same young person spends 1,064 hours watching a television. Just those two numbers right there should scare anybody, Okay. And 80 to 85% of the Christian homes in America send their children to the world to be trained by the world to think like the world, then we wonder why they go to the world. And then that same child is reinforced 
That 900 hours of school is being reinforced with that 1,064 hours in, the t in front of a TV, which is then being reinforced with 936 hours playing a video game. Why are we talking about television and movies and video games? Because that is a tool that is being used to get a generation to doubt. That ultimately is a key, getting a generation to doubt the Word of God. See, we need to know what the secular media, that the TV, the movie, the things that they're using, the impact that they're having. And then we need to live it, all right? When I do this talk, people will say to me, you must do nothing but watch television and movies because you're going to show us a bunch of clips. And you know what? Most of the things that I'm going to show you, I haven't even seen. But I've been doing this talk for such a long time that I have people that send me the clips. Thank you very much. I don't want to watch the junk. You want to send me the clips? I will use them. You see, we've got to be careful, and I'll talk more about this at the end, how we have to be careful what we let in front of our eyes. But then we have to share it. Let me be really blunt with you. Apologetics, I love it. Been doing it for over 20 some, 25 years, I think, now. I love apologetics. But if you do not have an apologetic that leads you to the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is worthless. If your apologetic is doing nothing more than just arguing people about age of the earth and rocks and bones, and it never gets to the point that Jesus Christ is ultimately the answer to the issue that we all suffer from, and it's called sin, it's worthless. I love apologetics, but apologetics is nothing more than, to me, pre-evangelism, breaking down walls that keep me from being able to spread the gospel to a generation that can't see it because they've been blinded by the world's wisdom. We break that down, but then we take it to Jesus Christ. And if you don't do that, it's worthless. I love that Ted used Hosea. I've been using this verse for a long time in this talk. Hosea 4, 6. You already know this answer. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see, this is where the battle is. It's a generation that doesn't know. We have a biblically, my country, I don't know about yours. We have a biblically illiterate church. Forget about the culture, all right? They're lost. They're supposed to be biblically illiterate. They're lost. The problem isn't the lost. The problem are the ones that are sitting in the 400,000 churches across my nation that couldn't give an answer for the reason for the hope that lied within them if their life depended on it. You see, television and movies, people tell me, it's just entertainment, Carl. When I go in there, I just turn my brain off, and I, it's just entertainment. Oh, no, it is not just entertainment. It is a tool that is being used to get a generation to doubt. You see, I put it like this. Without recognition, there can be no resolution. If you don't know the tools that Satan is using to get us to where we are, where we in my country have 400,000 churches and Christianity is almost invisible, you're never going to be able to overcome the battle. 2 Corinthians 10.4 tells us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That, to me, is what the apologetic is all about. Pulling down strongholds that are keeping a generation from listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just build my case as to why I think this is a wall. All right, according to research that has been done in my country, the leading influencers, leading influencers in our society are television, Books and magazines, public policy, family, movies, internet, uh, anything missing. God was not in the top 25 and church wasn't in the top 50. Of the leading influencers in my country where we have 400,000 churches and 80% of the people claim to be Christians. Guys, I'm sorry. My nation is done. When the best I have to offer to the world are the two people that are the front runners in our presidential candidacy, we are done. We are suffering the consequences of decisions that were made. Learn from us. Learn from us. Church not in the top 25, God not in the, or I'm sorry, God not in the top 25 and church not in the top 50. One of the conservative folks in America would be a Bill O'Reilly. He may be conservative, but he is not a Christian. And he says this, the media is the most powerful force in the country. And I have to admit, 
I think he's, I think he's true. I think he's correct. I do. Media is very powerful. Maybe not the top, because I'll talk about that later. Let me let a non-Christian talk to you for a second. It is time to recognize that the true tutors of our children are not school teachers or university professors, but filmmakers. Huh. Advertising executives and pop culture purveyors. Disney does more than Duke Spielberg outweighs Stanford and MTV trumps MIT. And I believe that there's a lot of truth in that little statement. Those are the things that are having the biggest impact on our culture. By the way, do any of you know who this gentleman is? Anybody know? Anybody? Oh, George Lucas. So he's even made his way up here. Yes. You know he's created his own religion, and that's all Star Wars is. It's a religion. You've got the dark side. You've got the light side. And by the way, the force, do you know how the force is like uh, duct tape? You know what duct tape is, right? The force is like duct tape. Did you know that? It's got a light side and a dark side, and it holds the world together. So, I mean... What does George Lucas have to say about the power of this medium of film? He says this, people in the film industry don't want to accept the responsibility that they had a hand in the way the world is loused up. But for better or worse, the influence of the church, isn't that interesting? He recognizes what used to have the impact. The influence of the church, which used to be all-powerful, has been usurped by film. Film and television tells us the way we conduct our lives, what is right and wrong. And how much of it is a generation watching in my country. Well, uh, by the time a child graduated from high school, they've watched 22,000 hours of TV, 200,000 acts of violence in that, and 640,000 commercials, 11,000 hours of music, 13,000 hours on the internet, and how many of those hours are attacking the word of God, Christianity, the, I'm telling you, it's just down the road. And we wonder why we have a generation that is not walking away from the church, running away from the church. Because they have been directly impacted and taught a worldview that destroys them ever from being able to understand the Word of God. Dr. John Nelson of the American Medical Association said that of 2,888 out of 3,000 studies, did you see that? 2,888 out of 3,000 studies show that TV violence is a causal factor in real life mayhem. It's a public health problem. But we don't see that? And the television and the movies and the video games just keep getting more and more violent? We can't see a connection there? Oh, we can see it, but we don't want to accept it because that might mean that you might have to change what you put into your eyes. There's a movie out right now called Fifth Wave. The others see our hope as a weakness, but they're wrong. The fifth way, the others see our hope as a weakness. Name of the ministry, Reasons for Hope. You know you can have lots of reasons for hope. We have lots of reasons, right? I mean, money in the bank, there's a great reason for hope, right? Oh, you're wagging your head at me. Okay. So the economy must be uh, as bad up here as it is in, okay. Uh, so that's not a good one. How about this? Uh, how about this? Uh, people like you. That's a great reason for hope. They pat you on the back and tell you how good you are. Right? Right? Right. Uh, trust me. People will turn on you in a dime. All right? How about this? Good looks. There's a great reason for hope. Uh, no. Looks change. I look a whole lot different now than I did 70 pounds ago when I got married. I quit counting years, all right? Look, if you place your hope in anything other than Jesus Christ, he's the only one that will never leave you, never forsake you. And if you put your hope in anything else, anything that the world can take away, they can and will. Be careful where you place your hope. But it was an interesting thing in this movie. There was a line where this young lady is, uh, she's trying to, uh, trust me, it's, it's complex. But... This young lady is trying to save her, uh, her brother from the aliens. And so as she's walking through the woods, she's writing in her diary. And in her diary, she writes this. How do you rid earth of humans? And the response that she put, because aliens have come to earth and they're trying to take over earth, so they're killing off all the people. But you can't tell the aliens from the humans because the aliens, okay, you don't really care. But this is the storyline, Okay. You can't tell who's an alien and who's not. So now the humans have turned against each other and are killing each other off because nobody trusts each other. Does that sound like something we see in our world today? You don't need to be an alien to turn people against each other. We got enough hatred to just go along just because you got a different hair color and you got a different eye shape and you eat a different food and you smell different. We got enough of that going on, okay? 
But it was very interesting. How do you rid earth of humans? This was the response. Rid humans of their humanity. Is this not a piece that I can talk with this younger generation that's watching this movie and reading these books? You better believe that it is. Do you know how you rid earth, or humans I should say, of their humanity? It's not difficult. The world's done a very good job of it. You know how they've done it? Rid them of their history. You want to rid humans of their humanity, rid them of their history. Change their history. Why do we have so much revisionist history in my country? Because you can destroy humanity. Watch, watch. If you rid humans of their history, the easiest way to do it, and it is not complex, the easiest way to do that is to take away this history right here. In the beginning, God. He created you. He literally knit you together in your mother's womb. He loves you in spite of who you are, what you've done. Enough to come and die on a cross for you. You see, that history gives humanity value. But if you remove that history, huh. See, if you're not created in the image of God, then you are created in the image of Hydrogen gas over the course of 14 billion years, transforming itself, turning itself into everything that we see? Oh, no. But by the way, by the way, I got to do this. I got to do this. Here's another history. For the one question. Oops. Nope, nope. I got to do, do it a different way. Got to do this a different way. I want you to hear this other history, okay? Because there's another history. Oops. This is the other history. It's coming. I hope. In the beginning... There was nothing, an infinite void. Then, in an instant, everything known to man came into being. The Big Bang, the birth of time itself, chaos and beauty. A beauty that created infinite galaxies. Galaxies that would one day create the unimaginable. Life but even more incredible. The human brain. The pinnacle of billions of years of evolution. A brain that possesses the power of reason and the ability to ponder life's most ancient riddles. Why are we here? Is there intelligent life beyond our galaxy? Hey, look, you got to understand, Christians and non-Christians, we both believe in a creator. We do. We do. We both believe in a creator, and both of our creators have existed for all eternity, have no beginning, have no end. That's, that's reality. And both of our creators begin with the letter G, and both of our creators have three letters. Ours is God. In the beginning, God. He created, and if he created the way that he said that he did, there should be evidence for it. Look around the world. Do you see such evidence? I do, just looking at that little simple chair sitting right there. That is like the coolest chair ever. It's a steel chair, but it reclines. Lean back. Watch it. It, it reclines. Huh? You kidding me? You think that just came together because you had an explosion in some steel mill somewhere? Now, if it didn't recline, maybe that happened. But these recline. That took design to make a chair that's made out of steel that can recline. And you think hydrogen gas transformed itself into this? Much less us? Oh, but there is that other creator. And what was it? Gas. Over the course of 14 billion years, hydrogen gas transformed itself. Big Bang exploded, created infinite beauty. Created the human brain? Are you serious? You think gas, given time, can turn into the brain? Look, I put it to you like this. It's very simple. 
you got two choices, God or gas. If you got gas, Bino will help you, but I'm not going to go there. What's the other question that man has pondered for years? Remember, I try to use the media as a springboard to conversations. This is an advertisement for a movie. Do you know what movie this is? Watch. For the one question that has puzzled mankind since the beginning of time. If God exists, then why did he make ugly people? That's a movie. That whole setup was a movie. But that whole setup is exactly what they teach a generation, 900 hours a year in a school, 1,064 in front of a TV, then however many hours are going to spend watching a movie. Did you catch that? In the beginning, there was nothing. Have you ever really thought about this? I'm going to talk about this tomorrow when I deal with answering skeptics. We're going to take Richard Dawkins, and we're going to deal with his claims. And one of them is, um, when he went on a uh, tour with a man named Lawrence Krauss, who was a physicist and wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing. And he and Richard Dawkins went on tour. We're going to take their video and we're going to deal with this. You can get something from nothing? Oh, that's tomorrow. Not going to go there today. Okay? But let me, let me show you this. You, you really don't think that they teach that the universe created everything? Watch. This is how the universe works. We're lucky that the Milky Way provides the right conditions for us to live. Our destiny is linked to our galaxy and to all galaxies. They made us, they shape us, and our future is in their hands. Either got God or you got gas. It is a religion, folks. It is a religion. An atheistic, humanistic religion. And that religion in my school, schools in, our, in my country has exploded. Now, I don't know if this is up here yet, but I'm going to make you aware of it because this is something that you can even do. And I would encourage you to do it. You can go online and take these classes from something called Big History. Just do a search on a Google search, Big History. And this is the website. You sign up, you can take the classes. These are the classes that are being taught. And I don't know how many schools across America, what they have done is they've taken a timeline of history, starting with the Big Bang, and they tie everything back into that history of billions of years. By the way, Christian, Aren't we supposed to be the ones doing that? Isn't that what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus with the two folks that didn't have a clue what was going on and what did he do? He took them back to the beginning, built a foundation so they could understand what had just happened and where they were headed. We should be the ones building out that biblical timeline of history and then tying back into it. If you want to understand why you're seeing this, let me take you here. Let me take you here. Let me explain it from a biblical timeline of history. The world is doing it. Bill Gates put $10 million into this program, and it is in schools big time. And I want you to hear, I, I want you to go take the class so that you know what this generation is facing. Mature generation, do not remove yourself from this younger generation. They look different. They like different music. They like drums. They got long hair. They, forget about it. They're sinners. They need a Savior named Jesus Christ. And mature folks should be the ones reaching across this divide that is going in our world today between the mature church and the young church. Mature church don't want to talk to them because they're different. They like this and they like that. They're lost. They need, you want to know what I find in my country? This younger generation, they are looking for somebody who will look them in the eye, love them, and shoot them straight. And shoot them straight. The, the straighter I talk to the younger generation, the better the response. They are hungry. And the world's feeding them right now. And this is feeding them. Let me let you listen. This is what breaks my heart. This is where I get passionate. Because I see what's going on in this younger generation. And I want you to hear, this is from NPR, which is a not a Christian radio station. And interviews that they did with actual students that have gone through this class. This is why you need to know what they're being taught. Because listen to the outcome. 
Timothy Frey and Kamal Shah say it's unlike any history class they've ever taken. Changed my way of how I think of humanity. <laughs> Like, I used to just think that, oh, we were the top species, but really, we're not. That's what I want out of my history class. There's more. Take a listen. I took AP World History, and we learned, like, a lot of facts, like, every little detail, but none of it actually connected. Like, in this class, everything connects. Like, we connected, like, the Opium Wars all the way back to the Big Bang, and I thought that was really interesting because... It actually made sense. Christian, we should be the one doing it because we are the ones that have the only true account of history. Starting from the only one who's always been there, who knows everything, who told us what happened in his word, we can trust it. But if we don't trust that biblical timeline, if we don't flesh it out and teach how to answer the questions that they're being confronted with using it, the world will not teach them that. They will undermine it, they will destroy it, they will mock it, they will ridicule it, and they're doing a good job of it. I learned a bunch of facts. Church, we are not about facts. We are about teaching the truth and teaching how to then take that truth and do something with it. And if you are not having application along with memorization, you might as well give it up. If you think memorizing without application will change this culture, it will not. I am living proof. I went through Stand up, sit down, kneel. I went through catechism. I knew everything to do. I'd have told you as a Christian until 26 years old, sitting in church pews, deader than a doornail. Memorization without application is worthless. One, one more, one more. It made me think a lot more about just the whole universe itself because it all started from the Big Bang, of course, and... When you think about it, he was saying that it'll all come to an end soon. So when you really think about it, what are we doing here? It just makes you think that uh, really everything will be meaningless soon. That's a history course I want my kids having, my grandchildren having. You better teach a generation how to think. I don't know if this is in your country yet. I would be shocked if it is not because it is very well done. Very well done. The videos are well done. I mean, it is well done. Big history is having a big impact. And so I pray that you're going to start teaching biblical history, not big history, biblical history. You see, the media is having an impact. How about this? Let's, let's move to something. The leading influencers in our country, let's go to books and magazines, okay? Um, I, I, by the way, I'm not going to do... These, these magazines, look, if you pick up science, if you pick up time, if you pick up those magazines, there is a worldview, they are coming after you, just, just know it. It's not that I'm afraid of them, I loved them. I get most of my information from them so that I can say, hey, there's what the world says, here's what the Word of God says, here's what we actually see. Teach critical evaluation. But I'm not going to do these, uh, you know, because it's a given. They're coming after the faith. I won't even do a goofy magazine like Mad Magazine. Yes, there is... An agenda. But I want to do something that's safe today. I, I, you know, I, I'm thinking, let's, let's do something safe. Something like a little children's book, you know? A children's book. That, that, that'd be a good place. How about something like this? Amazing Animals. This is just a, an elementary school book. Open it up to the very center of the book and take a look at what they teach. Anybody see anything? Do you see what they are teaching? Let me blow it up for you. Great, great grandparents, over many millions of years, the animals on earth have adapted and changed to the forms we know today. The same is true for human beings. Long after dinosaurs died out, but longer ago than anyone alive today can remember, the first people lived on earth. Let's take a look at what some of them were like. And then you see the whole tree starting down with the ape-like creature, turning all the way up into us at the very top of the tree. This is an elementary fun book talking about amazing facts on animals. No, it is a propaganda machine. So you better teach a generation how to deal with it. Also, one of the other pictures that they use is this one right here. Any problems with that? We have a generation that they grow up with these pictures, even in church many times, and then they think, 
Well, Noah's Ark, how did they fit two of every seven of some 10 billion species of animals on a wooden boat? That is pretty ridiculous. I guess the Bible couldn't get that right. Hey, I dealt with this the last time I was here, so go buy the whatever they have. The DVD, it's on there. We went through it. It's easy to answer. It's not complex. But how about this? How about this? What is the top-selling comic book over the last 20 years? We got some middle-aged guys in here. This is a middle-aged man question. Top-selling comic book. I'll help you. It's none of these. None of those. Anybody care to venture a guess? I have put you to sleep. I have these stone looks again. Anybody? Sir? What was it? No idea? No idea. No comic book readers? Was that? Star Wars. Star Wars. No, that's not in... Uh, wasn't a comic book a long time ago, but it's a good guess. It's definitely not Archie, I'll tell you that. Some people have said Archie. Come on, Archie? Guy? We weren't into the love triangles with Betty and Veronica. No, no, no. This is a man comic, okay? X-Men. Hello? Top-selling comic book over the last 20 years. Hands down is X-Men. By the way, I'm about to show you how shallow I am. I loved comics as a young man. I did. I did. And one of my special days in my life is I went to my friend's house, and my friend actually has a real number one issue of X-Men and Fantastic Four and Avengers and Spider-Man and Daredevil. And I got my picture taken with the uh, Captain America shield. You don't care. <laughs> it was a very special day in my life, okay? And I got to wear the Iron Man mask. Come on now. You know that's cool. You know that's cool. Well, anyway, X-Men. What does X-Men have to do with anything? Top-selling comic book and now major television and TV programs. I, I can't tell you how many uh, X-Men movies and spinoffs have been made. But what were the all about? What, what, what was the whole premise behind the X-Men? Have any of you ever seen any of the X-Men movie? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, not as many. So you'd rather watch Rocky than X-Men? Yeah, but X-Men, Wolverine's from Canada. Come on, brother, that's an X-Men. I mean, he's from Canada. You got to show him some love. What was the whole premise between, be, behind the X-Men? Well... Those of you that saw the movie, you had two types of mutants. You had the good mutants, you had the bad mutants, right? Why were the good mutants bad? Or why were the bad mutants bad? They wanted to rule the world, so what did they have to do to rule the world? They had to rid Earth of humans, get rid of the homo sapiens. Because they were homo superior. They had evolved to a higher level. This is what X-Men teaches, okay? Evolution is a fact, and there is no species on this planet that s s protects the weaker, inferior species. We have evolved to a higher level. Get rid of the inferiors. But the good mutants were good because they supposedly wanted to protect the weaker Homo sapiens. How did they get these special powers? They were all these special powers. Mutation. It is the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet. This process is slow, normally taking thousands and thousands of years. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps forward. Huh. Now, last time I was here, I did a talk on the fossils. For those of you that were there, let me now tie back into that talk because I want to teach application. Wait, Carl, this is just a movie. No, this is a teaching point. Do you know how many millions of young people have watched this series? So now let me take what they've watched and teach them what it actually supports. Does it support mutation, slow gradual processes? You really think that a mutation can take an amoeba, turn it into a worm, turn it into a fish, turn it into an amphibian, turn it into a rat, to turn it into a wolf, to go back into the ocean, become a blue whale? You think mutation can give you that? You don't understand mutation, okay? Mutation can take something that has two arms and give us no arms or give us three arms or four arms. It can take existing information and rearrange it or lose it, but it can add it. You cannot have a mutation and turn a scale into a feather. 
This doesn't explain it at all. And by the way, now let me give you real world application from the fossil talk last time. Oh, there it is, Carl. Mutation. You start down here with a couple lizards given enough time right circumstances, you get all the different dinosaurs. How are you going to argue with that? That's evolution. Oh, no, that is not. That supports creation big time. Big time. Let me show you. You see this uh, yellow band right here? According to the evolutionary model, which we need to teach our children, they need to know it better than the world because they've got nothing to be afraid of or ashamed of. That's 30 million years of time. Do you see all that white stuff in there? Do you know what the white stuff means? That there's no evidence. Because read, here's the red stuff. Red stuff, tinted areas indicate solid fossil evidence. So red is fact, white is fairy tale, fable, fiction, call it what you want. Makes for a cool comic book, but it does not make for real world application. What the evidence actually shows is that one thing stayed one thing, never changed from or into anything else. And according to their theory, things changed like crazy for 30 million years, and then for 150 plus million years, they said, that's it, I'm not changing because I like the way that I look. Seriously? Look, I wish I could only go back 20 years. Let me go back 20 years. I don't want to change from 20 years ago. It's not happening. you got things that haven't changed for 300 and 400 million years, according to this theory. Teach them how to think not what to think. What the evidence actually shows is what God said. God said he created kinds. He used that term 10 times in Genesis. And what do I see in the fossil record? Kinds. So what I see in the world is consistent with what I read in the word of God. It is not consistent with slow gradual processes over millions of years. And by the way, that movie has been turned into a very popular TV show now called Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And there are lots of people watching that as well. And I can use things from that to springboard into conversations. How about this, though? Let's go to something safe again, because I like doing the safe stuff. We're going to go to TV shows, something safe in the TV realm. How about, how about this? Has that TV show made it up here? Andy Griffith. Oh, you know Andy Griffith. I'm walking on very thin ice when I talk about Andy Griffith. I know. He is like, ooh, Andy's nice. He's safe. Yeah, I like Andy. Great show. Got some good stuff in there too, but it also has some mess in there. Matter of fact, one episode, uh, like, look, I like Barney Fife. Barney Fife was my favorite. I did. I did. I loved it. But Barney Fife and Andy Griffith were having an interesting conversation because in this episode, Opie found some dogs, and he brought the dogs to the jailhouse, but there was an inspector coming, and so they had to get all the dogs out. So they got all the dogs out, but then they came back, and there were even more dogs. They got those dogs out. Even more dogs came. Finally, they got all the dogs out, and then a thunderstorm comes, and this conversation takes place. I'm worried about him, Pa. Well, oh, look, Op, what were dogs a million years ago? You know, we have this mindset that, oh, in the good old days, look, there were no good old days. Even in the 50s and the 60s, the television shows were promoting messages. It's just reality. But we, we didn't catch them. We didn't, we didn't pay attention to it. It wasn't a big deal. It was there. It's in commercials. It's all over the place. How about this? I can't talk about Animal Planet uh, wild discovery. I can't. It's 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 like one of my favorite channels ever. I do. I love these because I get so much information from these. But the only thing is that I, I have to take the audio out. I get the film clip. I take the audio out, and then I replace it with a different history. And it's amazing stuff. But if you're going to watch it and not critically evaluate it, there's a generation that's getting chewed up and spit out with this stuff. How about again something safe? Bugs Bunny make it up here too. Messages in Bugs Bunny. Do you know Bugs Bunny was probably one, well, I'll deal with it. Yes, evolution was in there, but let me deal with something different. In this episode, Prehysterical Hair, Bugs is running. He's being chased by Elmer Fudd. He jumps and falls into a prehistoric cave. Did you hear that word? From a biblical historical account, is there any such thing as prehistoric? Genesis 1-1 is the beginning of history. There is no prehistoric. He finds a time capsule that has a film, and in that film, it has a history, and so he takes it and he pops it onto the film. Damn, it's all 
whole shit up. You gotta love Bugs Bunny music as a minimum. I mean, come on, they had the whole orchestra thing going on. And you read this, I mean, you got a Micronesian film documentary. Micronesia, that's where one of the first evolutionary ancestors was supposedly found. Java Man, uh, uh, cro Magnoscope, Neanderthal Color. So all the allusions to evolution. And what's the film about? Well, it's about hunting and killing, and only the best hunters could survive. And who is the best hunter? Well, Elmer Fudstone, of course. What did Elmer Fudstone hunt? He hunted the saber-tooth rabbit. Yes, the saber-tooth rabbit. His natural habitat is deep in the lush jungle. Oh, brother, get a load of that snaggle-tooth aboriginally. <laughs> hey, now, there's something mighty familiar looking about that joker. Could it be that he's one of my ancestors? Yeah, could be. Anybody catch anything interesting? Anything? What? You got to talk to me here. Come on. What'd you catch? What's that? One of our ancestors? But you mentioned one specifically. Anybody catch one specifically? Did you catch the aboriginally comment? Guys. It's a cartoon. Get over it, Carl. No, it's a cartoon, and it's teaching a generation. And you know what it taught us? Bugs Bunny was one of, the, one of the most racist cartoons ever. What they're talking about is the Australian Aboriginals. Do you understand that the Australian Aboriginals were classified as the missing link or the closest living relative to the missing link? So therefore, there was nothing wrong with killing them, getting rid of them. They had manuals on how to hunt them down, how to skin them, how to plug the bullet holes so that they could take them back and put them on display in museums in England. Guys, the Australian Aboriginals, because they were classified as not human and missing link or closest living relative to it, the atrocities, white men, let's, let me just be blunt, I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to be gentle here, we have young folks in here. White men raped the young ladies because they were trying to get rid of the blackness in the offspring. And this was all done in the guise of science and we're doing them a favor if you can dehumanize something, guys, you can get away with a lot. If you want to rid Earth of humans, rid humans of their humanity. We rid of them of their humanity, and the things that we did to them is unspeakable. It is not a joke. What did God say? God said we all go back to one man and one woman, so therefore there's one race, the human race. But how many in the church will take a stand on that? I'll tell you right now, that message has gotten me kicked out of churches. I had a church, and I won't tell you where. I had a church that uh, invited me to come speak. Pastor called up excited because he said, Carl, we never get phone calls for a guest speaker. I've had people call from three different states. He was excited. Ten minutes later, he canceled the speaking event. Why would he cancel the speaking event? He went from excited to cancel. I'm pretty good at PR. Anybody need a PR guy? I can, I can do some side work for you. I can take it from excited to cancel. Just give me ten minutes. <laughs> Why would he cancel? Because he found out that my wife is Japanese. And the church bylaws state that if they let a man in an interracial marriage speak in their pulpit, the pastor would be removed from ministry. Pastor, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, first man, Adam. Genesis 3, 20, Eve was called Eve because she is mother of all, not some, all living. Acts 17, 26 says we're all of one blood. Bible never talks about race other than running a good race, so therefore there's only one race to human race. How can you justify that biblically, sir? Sorry, Carl, canceled. You don't think this is a message? It's in there. It's in the cartoons. It's even in Peter Pan, but I won't go there. It's there. You see, guys, here's my point. If you don't teach a generation how to think, there's a lot of messages coming at them from all kind of different angles. Let me end with this, my favorite comic book character of all times, Spider-Man. I always wanted to be Spider-Man as a young man. I thought that would be like the best thing ever. I mean, Spider-Man had spider sense, and he, he knew when trouble was coming, and I was like, this would be a great thing to have. Anybody know how Spider-Man got his powers? How'd he get them? Radioactive spider. That's old school. They changed it in the movie. Why did they change the radioactive spider to a different spider in the movie? Because in the old school, 
I mean, they had a really cool song. Is he strong? And I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll give you the lyrics. Is he strong? Listen, bub, he has radioactive blood. Come on, any song that can use bub in it for a 13-year-old kid is cool. Why would they change the spider from radioactive to genetically enhanced in the movie? You know why? Because in the 1950s and 60s, when they were creating all these superheroes, radiation was the thing that could give the special powers, could cause mutation. Does radiation cause mutation? Yes, it does. You can start with two arms. You can get no arms or you can get three arms. Can you turn a scale into a feather? You see, they've done a lot of research on radiation. It does not add anything new. It destroys. So they had to change the spider because radiation doesn't work anymore. By, that, by the way, that gives me, a, gives me a way to talk about what evolution can and can't do using a superhero. And is there evolution in the first Spider-Man? Yeah. 40,000 years of evolution and we barely even tapped the vastness of human potential. You see, guys, I always wanted that spider sense because he, he knew when danger was coming. I thought, man, this would be so good. I'm walking home. I'm about to open the door. Oh, mama's mad. I'm out of here. <laughs> Mama was mad at me a lot because I was a bonehead kid, so it wouldn't have helped that much because I had to go home at some time. I'm 55 next month, and I'm having to accept a very sad, it's very sad. I'm never going to get spider sense. It's a bad day. But you know, I've also learned something else. There's something better than spider sense, and it's called Bible sense. But when you don't trust the Word of God, you're not going to use it. And we have a generation that has been taught not to trust the Word of God. And where are they being taught this? Average American spends 900 hours a year in a school, and if they're going to the government schools, they're being taught a history that undermines the Word of God. That same child is reinforced with 1,064 hours of TV that reinforces a false history, reinforces that Christians are closed-minded, intolerant, bigoted, opinionated, a bunch of weirdos. That's what they see. And then the world comes after the children, and they use Finding Nemo. They use Lilo and Stitch, Incredibles, Bob the Builder. And every one of those, every one of those have messages in there that undermine the Word of God. Every one of those. That's why I wrote the book, Remote Control, The Power of Hollywood, to take you to Bob the Builder, to take you to Spider-Man, to take, look at the messages in their parents if you're going to watch these things, teach your child to critically evaluate the messages. Now, I'm going to offend somebody here, and it's not intentional, but I feel like my job is to push a little bit, because church, we have become way too complacent. If you think you're going to reach a child raised on Finding Nemo and Lilo and Stitch by breaking out flannel graph, you are mistaken. I am not an anti flannel graph man. I am a guy that says, You got a generation that thinks different. You break out flannel graph, and there's a disconnect. We need to preach the gospel, never watering down, never mincing words, but you step up the presentation to reach a generation that just flat thinks different. That's all there is to it. They think different, they've been trained to think different. The world is not the same as when I was a 12 year old, 10 year old. It's different. I'm not telling you, mature folks, that you did a bad job. I'm telling you the culture has changed. You see, it's like this. The same way that Spider-Man has spider sense, the world has their own type of spider sense because they've been trained by the world to think like the world. So when they see a Christian, they have a preconceived idea of who we are. It's kind of like the Terminator. Did any of you see any of the Terminator movies? Anybody? Anybody? More people saw Terminator than X-Men. Okay. Now I know what I'm dealing with. Well, the Terminator character was programmed to do one thing specifically, and he saw the world in a very specific way. He had Terminator vision. I'm going to suggest to you that we have a generation that that's exactly what they have. They have worldly vision. They've been trained by the world to think like the world. So when you and I come out there and we start talking to them, and we hold out the Bible, what do they think about the Bible? It's an old, outdated book filled with fairy tales and fables. It's got all these mistakes and errors in it. I'm not saying that's true, but that's what they think. They see a Christian, they think we just got a bunch of opinions. We don't have answers, because ask a Christian a question, and most of the time, you don't get answers. You get opinions. Well, I think, I think, I think. We should be using the Word of God to back up our position. You see, when they see the Word of God, they don't trust it. And then we in the church many times break out our big evangelism gum. God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, this generation doesn't know God. Come with me to Japan, 166,000 gods in Japan. Stand on a street corner. God loves you. Which one? 
Our culture's not any better. And they don't know love. Because if you don't know God, you can't know love. And the way love is depicted to them on a television pro- program and a movie is, let's live together, let's shack up. That's not love, that's lust. But if you don't know God, you don't know. And wonderful plan, they can't see a wonderful plan. They've been trained by the world to look at the world through the lens of millions of years of death and suffering. So you tell them about a God of love, they say, I don't see a God of love. All I see are millions of years of death and suffering. What kind of a God would do that? Have you ever heard that? The one thing they get, though, is your life. You bet us my life. Quit imposing your values on me, you fundamentalist, closed-minded, intolerant. You see, if you're going to reach this generation, you're going to have to change the way that you think. You've got to understand, they got that spider sense going on. And we need to break down those walls that are keeping them from listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? You've got to understand that this generation is going to ask you questions. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And then we, many times, get mad. They're asking questions. Yes, they are. And yes, they will. And by the way, you and I are commanded to give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us. You know why? Because that's what God required of us. And by doing that, by breaking down the what about, do you know what happens many times? You get the opportunity to preach the gospel and reach the heart. To me, that's what it's all about, guys. But it means that you and I are going to have to get busy and get in the word and get answers for why we believe what we say we believe. Thank you for letting me be with you. I appreciate it.